Hello, I'm Tom West. I want to welcome you to my YouTube channel. I call it Life in the God Lane. Hope you'll subscribe to my channel. Share this video with other people. Give me thumbs up, make comments, and help me get this out to more people. We're going to teach the Bible and apply it to life and make sense out of the Word of God for people. I call this message The Price of Downgrading Jesus, and it's from Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through the first part of verse 6, verse 6 a. Let's pray before we do that. Father, I pray that you would take your word and speak to our hearts. And I pray that you would apply it to us and change us from the inside out. Make us the people you want us to be, have an impact on our life, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thomas Jefferson was the primary author of the American Declaration of Independence and had a lot to do with uh, founding this country. Great man, great, great man. Not perfect, you know, we've had that illustrated to us in the news lately, the last few years, but a great man had a great impact on our country. He was our third president and uh, served from 1801 to 1809, a two-term uh, president. Jefferson was a deist. That is, he believed in a divine being, but not that that divine being intervened in human events. The notion of Jesus being co-equal with the Father as the Son in the Godhead was not a thing that Jefferson would buy into in spite of the fact that he read the Bible. Jefferson based his beliefs on reason. He was a product of the, of the time when people figured things out by way of reason. He was not a person who based his beliefs on what I call revelation. And revelation is God revealing himself. And he does that through creation and through scripture. When he reveals himself through creation, that's natural revelation. When he reveals himself through scripture, that's special revelation. Uh, Thomas Jefferson's belief system was based on reason and not revelation. And thus it downgraded Jesus to just another man because he wouldn't take into account what the revealed truth from God revealed about Jesus. He reasoned things out. The price of downgrading Jesus is huge. There is a price to downgrading Jesus. Look at Mark 6, verses 1 through 6, the first part of verse 6. Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples, when the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked? What's this wisdom that has been given him that he even does miracles? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and, his, and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, only in his hometown, among his relatives, and in his own house is a prophet without honor. He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. Jesus gets downgraded in his hometown of Nazareth. Imagine that had to be kind of discouraging to go back to your hometown and have people downgrade you for less than, less than what God called him and revealed him to be. Jesus left there, meaning Capernaum probably, and, and journeyed to his hometown. His hometown was Nazareth. This is a journey on foot, probably 44, 45 miles on foot. It would take a few days to accomplish. When the Sabbath came, Jesus went to the local synagogue, and he was the guest teacher for the day. This is probably the synagogue that he was raised in, went to as a child. And he would be well known there. Go, Hey, the, the hometown boys come home. It would be kind of like going back to your home church to be the guest preacher for a day. This is almost certainly the first time that the hometown folks had heard Jesus teach. And they were amazed at his teaching. Now, to be amazed can be really positive or it can be really negative. Their amazement at Jesus' teaching turned out to be negative. Things go that way sometimes. 
They expressed their amazement out loud. Where did this local guy get this wisdom? You know, they're kind of taken back by it and a little bit, a little bit flummoxed by where this guy got all these smarts. We, we, we even understand that he does miracles, they said. How did he come up with that ability? That's their attitude about Jesus. They responded to Jesus with just recognition of him as human, as a guy from Nazareth, just the hometown dude from Nazareth. They recognized that he was the carpenter that they'd all, they all knew. Isn't this the carpenter? He'd probably done carpentry work for a lot of them. Many people are thinking, this is just the guy who was the contractor on the addition to my house. Nothing special, just a hometown guy who came back. The people of Jesus' hometown noted that he was Mary's son. We know his mom, Mary. She's our neighbor. Nothing special about him. Notice that they don't mention Joseph. We assume that he had passed away. That's typically what people would assume. But regardless of what they thought about Joseph, Joseph was not Jesus' father. God was his father. God was his father through the virgin birth. And regardless of any of these truths, they're downgrading Jesus to just another local guy, and that's a dangerous thing to do. The folks of Nazareth make it clear that they knew his brothers. They, they even named them. The text names them. James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon. Uh, James and Judas, Jude, who he's known as in the New Testament, pop up later. In fact, they wrote books in the New Testament, near the back of the New Testament. James wrote James, and Judas wrote Jude. They're his brothers, the brothers, the half-brothers of Jesus, the sons of Joseph and Mary. The folks affirmed that they knew his sisters, too. Notice, plural. She, he had more than one sister. Who is this guy who comes back to his own hometown and acts like a big-shot prophet when we know he's just another guy from Nazareth, not a prophet or a rabbi or some big-shot, just another dude from Nazareth? One reality that becomes obvious is that the doctrine of the perpetual virginity of Mary is not supported by Scripture. It's important to note that. Now here we have the names of four sons listed and the affirmation that Mary also had daughters, plural. So it becomes obvious that she and Joseph had a family of at least four more sons and more than one daughter. But don't miss this. This is important. We need, you know, doctrine is important. And we're going to emphasize some doctrine in this message without, it would be called a doctrinal message. There needs to be a whole lot more doctrine taught in our day. But don't miss this. Isaiah seven fourteen, about 740, 50 years before Jesus came, said this, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. The prophecy says that the virgin would be pregnant and that the virgin would give birth to a son who, who would be called Emmanuel, and that name means God with us. God showed up with us in the person of Jesus, Emmanuel. The prophecy required a couple things. The prophecy required that the virgin be pregnant. And the prophecy re required that the virgin give birth. Listen to what Joseph, the husband of Mary, did in Matthew 125. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son. And he gave him the name Jesus. When Mary gave birth to Jesus, she was still a virgin. She was a virgin when she got pregnant. She was a virgin when she gave birth to Jesus. After that, she and Joseph had a family the old-fashioned way. The folks of Nazareth could not handle that Jesus was the Messiah. They couldn't handle the notion that he was the prophet, priest, and king prophesied in the Old Testament. They just couldn't wrap their brain around that. Jesus was amazed at their lack of faith, and he noted that only in his hometown is a prophet without honor. He could not do any significant miracles in Nazareth, except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. Why is it? Because they lacked faith. They lacked faith in, 
in the real Jesus and who he really was. Jesus, the son of God, 100% man, 100% God, the 200% guy. When they downgraded Jesus to just another hometown guy, they left off his co-equality with God the Father and downgraded him in their eyes. Now, let me they did not downgrade him in reality because he is who he is no matter what anybody thinks. But they downgraded them in him in their eyes, which limited what he could do for them. Lack of faith limited what he could do. Today, some people do the same thing. They downgrade Jesus to just a good guy who loved people, did good, had some good teachings, some good things to say. People do that all the time. People who say they're Christians do that all the time. And they usually do the downgrade on the same basis that Thomas Jefferson did. They make their decision on reason, not revelation. And that's dangerous. And it carries a price. And it's all over the place today. But folks, people sometimes think they're smarter than God. They're not. They're not smarter than God. Remember that the real Jesus is upgraded. The real Jesus is upgraded. To get to the upgrade, I want to go back and relate the history of Exodus chapter 3 for you. Remember that Moses had fled Egypt after being born to Hebrew parents, but being raised by the Egyptian family of Pharaoh's daughter, the unique guy with certainly his background made him unique. He defended a Hebrew and killed an Egyptian. And that was found out. The word got out about that. He was a murderer. And so he fled Egypt and he went to Midian. Now Midian is way out in the boondocks, way out in the desert. While in Midian, Moses met and married a woman named Zipporah. She was the daughter of a shepherd named Jethro. Moses worked in Jethro's family business as a shepherd in the, in the wilderness of Midian. While way out in the wilderness tending his sheep, Moses came to the far side of the desert to a mountain called Horeb, H-O-R-E-B, which is referred to as the mountain of God. Horeb is a significant place. Moses would be back to this place in the future, and it would be called Sinai. Here he would receive the Ten Commandments in the future, but today he saw a bush that was burning but was not burned up. It was not being consumed, though it was burning. And here the angel of the Lord appeared to Moses. He called out to him. He said, Moses, Moses. And Moses responded with, here I am. And the Lord said, Moses, take your sandals off because the place where you are standing is holy ground. And God explained some things to Moses. He explained that he was the God of Moses' fathers and that he had a mission that he wanted to send Moses on. God wanted Moses to go back to Egypt and lead God's people out of Egypt because they were in slavery in Egypt, probably a couple million of them. And he wanted Moses to go back and lead them into the promised land. God had heard the cries of his people, and he wanted Moses to go back and lead them out. So God told Moses that he would be with him. He said, I'll be with you. I'll help you every inch of the way. I'll never leave you alone. And he did. And he told Moses that he would lead the people out of Egypt and they would end up at the mountain, that mountain called Horeb, the mountain of God. And Moses, God said, you will worship me on this mountain. He did. Moses asked God a question. He said, God, what happens if I go to the Israelites and I say to them that the God of their fathers sent me to them to take them out of Egypt. And they ask, what is his name? Well, what should I tell him? What should I tell him about your name, who you are? And so God says to Moses, you tell them that I am who I am sent me. I am, he said, sent me to you. Now, the Hebrew language, this is all written in Hebrew, is very emphatic at this point. It's like saying, I, I am. And the point is that God is eternal existence. This means that he has always been, is now, and will always be. It's hard for us to wrap our head around that because we have a physical beginning and end. But God is, always has been, and will always be. He is, I am. I am eternal existence. Exodus was written in Hebrew. 
The Hebrew was later translated into Greek for the Jewish world, the Greek-speaking world. And they call that translation the Septuagint. The Greek equivalent of this Hebrew word for God's name, I am, tell them I am sent you. The Greek equivalent of that Hebrew word is ego imi. And it's a very strange Greek construction. In Greek, the word imi means I am all by itself. But ego imi adds an extra I to I am. It's like, it's like saying I, I am. And that is the Greek that translated the third, the name of God in the third chapter of Exodus. And it's very specific and it's very unusual. It's the name of God. It's the name of God. Now, in John the eighth chapter, Jesus is fuss, fussing with the Jewish leaders about who he was and the fact that he preexisted Abraham. And I want to quote John eight fifty eight. very important verse. Jesus says, I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, before Abraham was, here it is, I am. The Greek there is ego imi, or I, I am. He's using the name of God for himself, just like it was used in the third chapter of Exodus. You just experienced the Old Testament revelation of God and the New Testament, Testament revelation of God, and Jesus is him. That's the point. Jesus is co-equal to God the Father in the Godhead. To downgrade Jesus to less than co-equal to the Father carries a price. It removes faith. Why? Because Jesus is the object of faith. And the real Jesus is co-equal to the Father. The real Jesus is I, I am. He's God's name. And without faith, you know, he's the object of that faith. And if you remove the reality of who he is, you remove faith in him. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. First chapter of Hebrews says that. The Jesus downgrade does a lot of things. It removes miracles. Only God can do real miracles, okay? Without miracles, guess what you lose? You lose the resurrection. And without the resurrection of Christ, you may as well gather around the tomb of any old dead guy because dead guys can do you no good. But with the real Jesus, you gain the resurrection and the living God in Jesus can make all the difference in the world in your life and head you for heaven. Listen to Colossians 1.19. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. The fullness of God dwells in Jesus. Jesus the subject. The fullness of God dwells in Jesus. In fact, God was pleased to have the fullness of God dwell in Jesus. In the very next verse, in Colossians 1.20, notice that what God would do with Jesus in whom the fullness of God dwelled, okay? This is what he would do with Jesus, identified as the one Jesus in whom the fullness of God dwelled. And through him, it says, to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. God reconciled all things through Christ, and that's Christ who has the fullness of God in him. That's who Jesus really is. To reconcile means to bring back into relationship. God brings us back into relationship with himself by making peace through the blood of Christ shed on the cross. Who reconciles and by whose blood is that relationship restored? Who makes peace through the blood of his cross? The guy in verse 19 in whom the fullness of God dwells. The real Jesus who is as much God as God the Father. Only Christ in whom the fullness of God the Father lives. To downgrade Jesus to less than co-equal with the Father carries the price of loss of salvation and eternal life, because only Jesus, who is as much God as God the Father, is the one who, who provides that for us. He's the only one in the history of the universe who came to restore people back to God through his blood. And it comes down to this. Jesus, no downgrades. No downgrades ever for Jesus. Let's pray. Father, help us to accept Jesus for who he is. He is as much 
God as God the Father, as much God as you are. It just happens to be God the Son. The fullness of you, the fullness of deity dwells in Jesus. Help us accept him as that. And we know that with that comes the removal of all our sin, the restoring of us into that relationship with you. We praise you for the real Jesus who is co-equal to you. Help us grasp that today and pass it on to others, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I hope you'll share this message with others, and I hope it has an impact on you. And I'll see you each day for my power verse or verses for the day. And this coming week, we're going to work all the way through the 23rd Psalm with those power verses. Be looking for it. It'll pop up the night before each day. I uh, will see you soon. God bless you. Have a great day.